Hello and welcome to today's webcast, The True Cost of Pressure Sewer Ownership, sponsored by E1 Sewer Systems. My name is Angela Godwin. I'm Chief Editor for Waterworld Magazine, and I will be your moderator today. A few housekeeping items before we begin. The slides for today's presentation will be pushed out to your screen automatically. A PDF of those slides is available in the Event Resources tab in the console window. This presentation is both live and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question button in the presentation window. If you are running any pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, it is recommended that you close down all other applications for better performance. If you have any technical difficulties during the webcast, please just type your issue into the Ask a Question box, and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the problem. A certificate of attendance will be issued automatically via email today to all attendees at the conclusion of the presentation. Just please be sure to stay logged into the webcast until you see the congratulations message. For your convenience, the presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent out to all registrants with a link to that archive. It will also be accessible from our homepage at waterworld.com. All right, well, we have two pr terrific presenters for you today. First, we have Chuck Mayhew. He is the Western Regional Sales Manager for E1 Sewer Systems. He has more than 20 years of public and private experience in project management, engineering, and supervision. As a professional engineer, he's had the opportunity to manage small projects and multi-million dollar projects from design through construction. His specialty is low-pressure sewers. We also have Henry Albro. He is a senior application engineer with FR Mahoney and Associates in Rockland, Mass. He has over 40 years of experience in municipal operation and construction of wastewater facilities. The last 17 years have been deeply focused on design, sales, construction, training, and service of pressure sewer systems. He has an associate degree in civil engineering from Vermont Technical College, holds a grade 7C Massachusetts wastewater operator license, and NUIA grade 4 collection system license. And now, without further ado, I will turn the program over to Chuck. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, over the next 40 minutes or so, Henry and I are going to be sharing some information with you related to the long-term cost of owning a grinder pump based sewer collection system. I'm going to start with a basic overview of a grinder pump system and I do this not only to introduce the technology to those not familiar with it but also to draw a distinction between two commonly confused pressure sewer systems that is a grinder pump pressure sewer and an effluent pump pressure sewer system. An effluent pump pressure sewer is referred to as a step system and it utilizes a septic tank. This type of system does not have a grinder but simply an effluent pump that's discharging to a network of small diameter pressure mains. Whereas a grinder pump pressure sewer relies on small packaged grinder pump stations pumping into, again, a network of, of uh, small diameter pressure mains. These two systems are commonly confused, but today we are focusing on grinder pump pressure sewers. Once we have the basics out of the way, we'll evaluate some historical case study information to show that the cost of maintaining a grinder pump system may be lower than you think it could be. Next, I think it's important to understand what drives up O&M costs in pump stations and discuss ways to reduce those costs. You will see that a low cost of ownership is actually a deliberate function of design and not just a happy accident. Finally, I would like to introduce the concept of asset management in relation to pressure sewer systems. That should set the stage for Henry, who will then take over and go into detail on case studies that will help you understand how our metrics are derived and the benefits of municipal management with pressure sewers. <clears throat> if we achieve our objective today, 
you should have an accurate impression of how dependable and cost effective a well-designed pressure sewer system can be. We will try to do that utilizing sound asset management principles and supporting that with real-world project O&M data. The low cost of ownership will combine uh, experienced designers, a reliable product, sound installation, and qualified service over the life of the system. We intend to show you with project data and product design features how to build and maintain a pressure sewer system with a level of service approaching that of a traditional gravity sewer system, but at a lower cost. The true cost of ownership or life cycle cost will include the capital cost, annual operation and maintenance, and replacement cost. Good decisions are based on good data. And once we present the long-term case study data, which is in this case going to be based on E1 grinder pumps because there's no other data available in the marketplace, you will understand why pressure sewers are so often the solution municipalities and developers alike are looking for. And I'll leave it to Henry to then discuss the value of municipal ownership or maintenance of pressure sewers. All right, so from this point forward, I'm gonna use the term pressure sewer to talk about grinder pump based sewer systems. Again, no septic tanks or effluent pumps are part of this pressure sewer discussion. In its simplest terms, the pressure sewer system has a grinder pump station installed at each home or business, as you can see on the diagram on the left. Everything going into the self-contained tank is ground up into a fine slurry and pumped out through an inch and a quarter pipe. Each of those pipes is connected to a force main in the street that eventually discharges to a manhole or a pump station or headworks. I frequently see many cases where a decentralized wastewater treatment plant is coupled to a pressure sewer collection system uh, for a resort or a development that's just too far distant from an existing municipal system. A typical installation will have a grinder pump station buried near the structure. The alarm panel which also provides the power source from the home, is mounted nearby and within inside of the station. With a grinder pump, everything is pumped out. Nothing but a small volume below the off level remains in the tank. It does not go septic and therefore has no odors. Shut off and check valves are on the pump core itself, which you can see in the tank here. But a redundant valve assembly is also located at the property line, as shown, for premise isolation. This keeps each individual lot isolated from the effects of the main line system in the right of way. In the case of a building lot that is below grade, the grinder pump station can simply pump up to a gravity line in the street. But a more typical application is a larger area with dozens or hundreds of homes connected in a network of small pressure pipes. This may include an entire development or a large area with failing septic systems that needs to get connected to the public sewer. I'd now like to talk about the cost components for owning and maintaining a pressure sewer system. The first component, <clears throat> excuse me, is the capital cost. This is the cost of designing, installing, and commissioning the system. This may include costs associated with assessment district formation, procuring easements, or applying for fun, uh, public funding sources. Of course, the cost of installing the system is part of the life cycle cost of the project, but we are not going to focus on the capital cost of the pressure sewer system today. Most engineers and utilities understand and recognize the cost saving benefits of a pressure sewer versus a gravity sewer. You've got smaller trenches, smaller pipes. You use different equipment and installation techniques, such as directional drilling, and lower social costs. All of these lead to a capital cost that is often half of what a gravity sewer extension would be. Further, the source of funding for the capital portion of a project is often different than the source of funds needed to maintain and replace the system over its installed life. Because this ongoing annual maintenance cost is what most of us have to live with, 
the term cost of ownership as we use it today will really focus on maintenance, repair, and replacement. Okay, so the operating cost is typically the cost of infrastructure to run a municipal pump station, such as electricity and communications. The cost of electricity to the municipality for a grinder pump station is zero because the source of power is from the home. However, if the homeowner wants to consider the, that cost of electricity, it would typically be less than a dollar a month at about 12 or 13 cents, uh, cents per kilowatt hour. If a municipality chose to install an optional remote communication system with each grinder pump station, then there would be a nominal annual fee for the data service. The ongoing annual maintenance cost will include labor and materials for responding to service calls, alarm conditions, and making needed repairs. And finally, to get the total cost of ownership after installation, we could add an annualized amount for replacing the pump core at the end of its life. This amount will vary based on the manufacturer's useful life and replacement costs. The typical utility has some number of municipal pump stations in their collection system. And those of us who have or are working in the public sector all know what the common problems are with those lift stations. It's dealing with so-called flushables, cleaning wet wells, uh, cleaning floats and level control devices to ensure they function properly, deragging or unclogging pumps, and, and then troubleshooting communications problems. So for these reasons, the idea of installing a grinder pump system with 12 or 120 pumps is often met with anxiety or reservation from those inexperienced with a quality pressure sewer system. When it comes to the cost of maintaining any pump station, you know that these issues are the ones that drive up the cost for the utility or the owner. Therefore, if I could find and install a product that specifically addresses these issues by mitigating their impacts, then I could drastically reduce the cost of ownership. In fact, I hope you can see that when considering a pressure sewer project, it would actually be imperative to find a system or product that specifically addresses ways to reduce these cost drivers that are common to pump stations. So if I could find a product, for example, with a level control system that is not in contact with the sewage and therefore non-fouling, or a grinder mechanism specifically designed to prohibit jamming, then I would be able to reduce the number of service calls and therefore my cost of ownership. Now, if I could also find a system based on a progressing cavity pump instead of a centrifugal pump, since these are all working in parallel, then I could expect my mains to be scoured consistently due to the nature of that pump curve. What about the quality of the components? Is the pump so cheap that it's a throwaway or does it get repaired and put back in service? These are all things that need to be considered. And if I could work with a company that not only helps designers and installers every step of the way, but also certifies service providers, then I'd be looking for a company that manufactures a purpose-built product. These are the design and manufacturing features that, if deliberately considered, can significantly reduce the cost of ownership for a residential grinder pump system. And it's for these reasons that E1 can promote and demonstrate <clears throat> through case study data that the average or mean time between service calls is at least 10 years and that an annual budget of $35 per year per station would take care of service calls and associated repairs. So now I'd like to show you a summary of several E1 pressure sewer projects to validate these claims. The first group of projects is from our first generation of grinder pumps, the 200 series. These were manufactured between 1970 and 1994. Here you can see four projects from all over the country with varying numbers of pumps 
and duration of service. Now the raw data on service calls, the frequency of those service calls, the time uh, to respond and make repairs, et cetera, those are all collected by the utilities uh, and then evaluated and then tabulated here for the purposes that we're using them, which is for the O&M cost and the mean time between service calls. Now if we average those out, we're going to find that the average annual cost for service calls and repairs is about $35 per year. The calculated mean time between service calls is just over seven years. These are the key metrics in evaluating the performance and reliability of a pressure sewer system because they provide direct insight into the cost of ownership. We can now look at the next generation of grinder pumps produced between 1995 and 2007 with these results. As you can see, the average annual cost for maintenance is a little lower at $32 per year, but the mean time between service calls has significantly increased to 16 years. Although this is impressive, it may be hard for some of you to believe, but I, I'd have you remember that in our case, E1 only makes grinder pumps for pressure sewer applications. So the product is purpose built to avoid the many problems that we mentioned earlier that are common to pump stations. However, the mean time between service calls is not just a function of product strength, but it's also the quality of design, installation, and the long-term service practices. So for example, a poorly constructed system will require more maintenance over time to deal with site-related problems, whether that was poor backfill or improper wiring. Or an untrained service technician will likely not troubleshoot an alarm condition properly and therefore come to the wrong conclusion on what to repair. This leads to more frequent service since the root of the problem was not resolved. So in order to significantly improve the mean time between service calls, Diligence and proficiency is required, or at least should be, from design to construction to service. Now, I'd also like to draw your attention to this observation. How is it that the interval between service has doubled in this case, but the actual cost to maintain these pumps has not had a substantial reduction, for example, halved? Well, the cost of doing business has increased over the years, not only inflation, but the cost of parts and labor. If the mean time between service calls had not significantly increased over the last couple decades, then the average cost to maintain one of these systems would be much higher instead of roughly the same. And I think that's an important factor to recognize. So in summary, I have shown examples of many projects that indicate an E1 pressure sewer system should have an average service interval of at least 10 years on any given pump in a system. And for budgetary purposes, I often recommend $35 to $50 per year uh, per pump for maintenance and repair. And then finally, if I want to take into account the replacement cost <clears throat> of the pump every 20 years and amortize that, I can get a good estimate of the cost of ownership of a pressure sewer after the capital cost is expended. I would uh, like to introduce the idea of asset management at this point. <clears throat> asset management encompasses a number of considerations, but I want to highlight the interaction between maintenance activities and the financial liability of a pressure sewer system. A pressure sewer is a collection system and as such should be managed as any well-maintained gravity system would be maintained. The maintenance tasks are different, but the need to maintain the physical asset is no different. The idea is that a sewer improvement that specifies quality products and installation practices will be more dependable and lower the life cycle cost to the owner. Further, if it is properly maintained according to the best practices associated with that system, it will minimize the financial impact on ratepayers and mitigate other risks such as overflows, uh, compromising system integrity, or environmental degradation. And I often have 
utility managers and, and engineers ask me about ownership and maintenance responsibility for grinder pumps. Their first concern is whether they have the resources to manage such a system under the perceived cost of doing so. Um, I hope that the information presented so far has shown you that the cost is actually quite affordable. But after explaining many of these com concepts that I've shared with you today, I, I advocate for an active CMOM application for a pressure sewer asset or system, just like they would for their gravity sewer system. CMOM framework can provide the quantitative confidence that you need to have in a pressure sewer system. And of course, that in turn will allow you to focus your attention on meeting the needs of your ratepayers in a cost-effective way. Now, uh, at this time, I'm going to hand this off to Henry to dive into the details of uh, two projects that demonstrate the advantages of municipal maintenance. Thank you, Chuck. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, we have a phone. Oh, there. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Sorry about that uh, little delay there. Um, when we were doing the pre pre preparation for this, Chuck and I did talk about the value of CMOM. And what I wanted to do is introduce and show a little bit about how this relates to the grinder pumps. I have a lot of information to cover on two case studies, and uh, we'll see if we can work within the timeline that we have. Uh, pressure sewers are part of a system. It is an integrated system with a grinder pump tying into the system as Chuck described. And these assets are critical to the performance of the overall system. So if the grinder pumps are not properly maintained, uh, then you have issues with the homeowners not being able to discharge their wastewater uh, correctly. So proper maintenance and oversight are keys and they're very important. So here we go. Now when Chuck was talking about the expectations of a sewer system, uh, we look at construction costs typically 40 to 60 percent less than a gravity sewer. These are things that we often talk to people about. Chuck mentioned the power cost. We're looking at about $9 a year using an 11 cent per kilowatt hour and a mean time between service calls in excess of 10 years. And as Chuck pointed out, cost of ownership of $30 to $50 per year. So let's put this into maybe a perspective that we all can relate to, looking at the life expectancy of common household appliances. Just a simple search online, I was able to find this information about the average life of the things that we commonly use every day that also require power to make them work. One of the questions we get about grinder pumps is that they do require electricity. Well, all of these appliances that we commonly live with uh, as well rely on electricity. So service type of repairs that might include, this is a mechanical device, it has electro electrical components, and there may be non-pump related issues, installation issues. Um, things that might, people might see might be manufacturing defects, certainly uh, new equipment, some normal wear and tear of the equipment, installation issues, a cut pipe or a, a cut wire or improper grading might be some things. Certainly extreme weather, and we've all seen extreme weather around the countryside of late. And uh, then there's that homeowner abuse and neglect of putting things down the sewer that really shouldn't be there. So what I want to do is I want to bring up two case studies that we did evaluation of, similar to the projects that were presented earlier in this presentation. The community of Chelmsford and Warwick, uh, Chelmsford Mass and Warwick, Rhode Island, equally have about 21 to 22 years of experience with grinder pumps. The data that we're using is based on our service records of E1 grinder pumps. Chelmsford, the first case study, is a hybrid system, meaning that it has a blend of gravity sewer, pressure sewers with force mains, uh, gravity to pump stations, private lift stations, and then several miles of pressure sewer systems. In the pressure sewer systems, they have over 525 grinder pumps 
installed from 1996 to present day, and the majority of those being Environment One semi-positive displacement pumps. The town required uh, purchase pumps over 21 years as part of uh, sewer extension projects. They were bid out with the utility work. Uh, sometimes they did direct procurement bids, and then uh, the town took ownership. The homeowners, through their drain layer, then took possession of the pumps and hired a drain layer who then did the work for the homeowner, and that cost was paid directly for the installation work paid by the homeowners. Several years into sewer expansion uh, in Chelmsford, a citizens group was formed to try to convince the town to take over ownership of the grinder pumps. This was a very new concept. This was something that uh, the town was a little bit uh, certainly reluctant to consider. And one of the things that we did to try to help was perform a study to look at the data to see what the real costs of ownership were, what would be the impact of such a bold step of taking over ownership of the grinder pumps. The um, presentation talks a little bit about something that we did in the NUIA journal, uh, NUIA.org. There is an article that discusses in more depth than we have time today of uh, the Marion, Mass, and Chelmsford projects. So if you're looking for more information afterwards, I would encourage you to go to the NUIA website. Sewer authorities have to rely on proper data to make decisions. These things, uh, these decisions shouldn't be made in a vacuum. You really need to look at the facts. The facts are important. Private ownership of grinder pumps being repaired through a private agreement with a plumber or an electrician. Oftentimes, we don't get the cost. We don't see the invoices. So it's hard to compile all of that data. We were fortunate in our case to be able to compile data because we were the service provider for the community. So anecdotal information from a group of residents that might have particular issues may not be all telling the entire story. So we have to be careful about what we use for the data to make these important financial decisions. In the absence of reliable data, some bad decisions certainly can happen. So in 1992, our company developed a very in-depth database that was used to mine about 13 years of actual service invoices and service history in Chelmsford. We really weren't sure what we were going to find when we started this, but as, as we dug into this a little bit further, we found that the information was supporting the claims that you've been hearing today. This slide has a lot of information. I want to kind of walk through a little bit and give you some time to look at it. Mean time between service calls for Chelmsford has been shown to be in excess of 13 years. Falls in line with what Chuck was talking about earlier. In 2000 to 2013, we were able to come up with a number of pumps installed each year and then the number of years in service and typical to the Man hour, I guess that's not going to click unless I do next, pardon me. Okay, uh, like we would measure man hours to construct uh, something, this is a measure of pump years, years of service, numbers of pumps. From there, we looked at a weighted average cost of service, and we looked at a weighted mean time between service calls. The next slide will show the cost in detail. This one is dealing with the actual numbers of pumps serviced, and on average, we're looking at about 6.5%, 7% of the pumps in the population saw a required service in a given year. Because this project was built over a series of, of years, there were groups of grinder pumps that were purchased in bulk. So you, it's natural to see some waves, perhaps, of uh, coincidental service requirements. So some of the years we do have some higher percentages uh, as the, the pumps reach the age where they might require service. Uh, again, uh, what we see here is that on average, weighted average over 13 years, mean time between service calls for Chelmsford. We wanted to look a little bit at the age of the pumps because we want to be prepared for any replacement costs that might be needed. And 
with the average age of this report, seven years is the, about the average age of the population in Chelmsford. Uh, about 50% were just under five years, 15% were under 10, and the remainder uh, 10 to 15 years might be the area where uh, planned replacements should be considered. Based on the report of the citizens at the time, about 53 pumps in 2014 had been replaced. The cost of ownership, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, in this slide we looked at the invoicing for each year to the town, of, uh, to the residents. We accumulated all of the, the invoices that we had, and in a few years there were some some expenses for perhaps some spare parts and some replacement cores, but overall you can see the average cost of a service call was around $900, and that would be labor, time of travel, and repairs included. And this is what the citizens were trying to get away from. They wanted to just pay on their user rates for service and not be facing a bill. So when we look at this and we average it up, you can see that the town of Chelmsford was looking for some budget numbers. $49 a year was about where we felt was a comfortable average for them to plan uh, for taking over grinder pumps. Some of the things that can cause a problem would be installer issues. And what you'll see here in the red bar graph is that in 2003-2004, we saw pretty good percentage of issues that were installer related. The town then instituted a requirement for installer training cert certification and each drain layer had to get an endorsement on their license to install a grinder pump. They had to attend our schools. And from there we saw quite a drop in the installer related issues. Earlier I mentioned a little bit of a wave maybe of, of service calls because pumps were aging based on when they were all put in. And you can see a little bit of that rise in 2011, and then it starts to ebb back off in 2012-2013. So service call breakouts is one of the things that we wanted to do to make our data collection better was to have our technicians identify things a little bit more clearly on invoices so we could understand where issues might, have, might occur. And if you look at 11% in 2013, we had about 11% of the calls, uh, pumps were, were serviced, and the town was also concerned about abuse. If the town took over the pumps, would residents abuse the system and not be as concerned if they're not paying for it? And what we found in just this little snapshot view is about 1.2% 1, 1 were abuse cases. Those were the people flushing the wipes and things that maybe shouldn't be going down the drain. After we break it all out, service-related, pump-related repairs that couldn't be explained by a warranty or an installer defect was about 6% of the, of the population. So it gave us some good confidence that um, we had a good handle on where maybe the town could focus on public education and things of that nature. So Chelmsford, by town meeting vote, went into a three-year operation maintenance agreement. They went out to bid, service contractor was selected, and um, prior to taking over the system, all the assets were inspected to get a baseline of where things stood. Major repairs were identified, major items were taken care of. And I liken this to the person who goes into the auto body, or the auto shop to get a new muffler and their tailpipe needs to be replaced, and maybe their whole exhaust system needs to be replaced. Repairs are kind of a budget decision, and the mechanics were authorized to do certain levels of repairs and forego the others. So in this evaluation of the Chelmsford system, some of those forgotten repairs or uh, postponed repairs had to be addressed. Public education was another area where the town stepped up and uh, sent out mailings to people to try to educate them and to inform them of the work that they were performing on their properties. 
service costs were higher, and we want to point out that when you go out to a contract that there are prevailing wage rates and things that uh, drive the cost up from what a private entity might charge an individual homeowner. They had to do some repairs, so that initially their budget was much higher to bring things into uh, compliance. However, since then, the service issues have declined. The data is still being compiled, and I expect that there will be a presentation at some point in the future about how the, uh, this system has worked. This contract has actually been renewed for another three years, and they've actually cut the time on site by the uh, contractor in half. So there is optimism that they've gotten the handle on the system. Conclusions for Chelmsford, and then we'll talk about Warwick, is that uh, grinder pump responsibility has become part of the town budget. The town uh, sewer department charges in their rate structure for repairs and maintenance that's built into their system. And the homeowners have been lifted of the burden of that direct cost that they might have. However, they're paying for it in their user fees. So it is being funded and it is being supported. Service records are maintained on an iData collect uh, system using an Apple um, iPad touchscreen. Service uh, records are maintained. They're included in the database. Pictures are taken at key points to document. So the documentation is increased dramatically from the old paper records that used to be used. And uh, what they found is that emergency call-outs from all of this diligence have been reduced and customer satisfaction has increased tremendously. The success of the program relates right back to the CMOM presentation that uh, Chuck mentioned. The value of CMOM and doing preventive maintenance um, is definitely a good, a good thing to see here. Warwick, Rhode Island, um, not to give you all kinds of uh, slides because we follow the same format. Um, the authority used pressure sewers for the last 22 years. They have over 1,700 stations and 16,800 pump years. Again, I'm using that term like man hours in their system. Pump procurement for Warwick has been similar to what Chelmsford was. They, they actually put uh, procurement out to bid. The sewer authority supplied a pump to each homeowner, and then the installation work was paid for directly by the homeowner um, to complete the sewer connection. The initial service uh, in Warwick was performed by private entities, plumbers, electricians, and, and so forth. And under the purchase procurement process, Warwick asked for extended warranties by the manufacturer, and since 2007, the bulk of the service has been performed by us, our manufacturer, uh, as a representative, and uh, so therefore we were able to gather some good data to show you today. Um, this has resulted in, in uh, more reliable data than just trying to pick and choose some individual invoices. So Warwick and F. R. Mahoney engaged in installer training courses similar to the practice in Chelmsford. We're following uh, the certified installer and certified startup programs that have grown from our experience. Extended warranties have been implemented to a three-year purchase, um, a three-year warranty over a five-year purchase time period. And for the last 10 years, we have been gathering data, and we have shown that the mean time between service calls and the cost of ownership are in tune or in line with what Chuck has presented to you earlier. The residents are still responsible for the invoices for the direct repairs. That has not changed. They still can call anyone they want, but they're encouraged strongly to call the manufacturer's provider. With the added warranty plans, the majority of that work has fallen to FR Mahoney & Associates. So to say that this is 98 or 99 percent of the data, there, it's a good strong percentage of the data uh, that we're, we're looking at. Um, cost options to the homeowner are still, do you want to fix it, do you want to replace it, how much do you want to fix? So the homeowner still has discretion on how much um, we spend of their money. 
So the mean time between service calls in Warwick is running around 18 years, and the rolling cost of repairs around $26 per year, which is in line with what we have talked about earlier. Ownership costs of the grinder pump assets have consistently proven in these two case examples and the previous ones that you, you saw earlier around $30 to $60 per year. Depends on the community, certainly. CMOM works. CMOM practices, preventive maintenance works. Mean time between service calls for these products have improved dramatically as technology improves and our knowledge base improves. We believe that sewer authorities who might be reticent to embrace this technology may be missing a great opportunity to provide lower cost service to their ratepayers. We have over 48 years of in-the-ground experience, and we've seen just a little bit of that today in the presentation. Um, to that, I think I'll turn it back so we can go to questions. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you, Henry, and thank you, Chuck, for your presentations. We really appreciate it. As Henry mentioned, we are going to uh, move into the question and answer portion of the presentation today. I just want to remind you that if you would like to ask a question and you haven't done so yet, you can still do that. You would just enter your question into the ask a question box on your screen. So with that, let's go ahead and dig in. Um, first question from a viewer. Are you assuming that the maintenance and replacement costs of the pump station will be borne by the utility company? I, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll answer take better. That. Chuck, you want that? Yep, I'll take that, Henry, and you can add anything you might have. No, the assumption is not that the, uh, the cost of maintenance will be assumed by the utility, but that is certainly an option that we are portraying here. Um, I think uh, certainly on the West Coast where I'm located, but across the country, most of the grinder pump based pressure sewer systems that we see are, are privately owned, uh, whether and that could be an HOA, um, uh, but, but, uh, and, and maintained by those same groups versus a utility or public interest uh, owning and maintaining them. Although they're, they're scattered all over the place. And that is a, an option I think that we're trying to focus on today because um, we certainly feel that um, organizations that are, have people that are trained in sewer services and how to maintain sewer systems and how, how you know, the, the dangers and safety issues associated with sewage and, and so forth um, are, are better suited to uh, maintain and take care of any type of sewer collection system. Um, as we know, homeowners, they have, they have no knowledge and really they have no interest in sewer systems. So uh, we're, we're trying to portray the opportunity really here today of utility uh, owned or maintained systems. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go I ahead. I want to add that, you know, there are many models and we could probably do a whole webinar just on the different models of how this could be done. But certainly if the utility is involved in oversight, or assisting residents, it's going to lead to success. So they can be engaged to any level that they, they feel possible. Um, most utilities don't want to hire additional personnel. And in the Chelmsford case, it was actually put out to contract. And um, in Marion, Mass, that I alluded to earlier, um, it, they actually contract directly with us as a service provider. So there's many ways it can be done. Okay, terrific, great. Thanks, guys. Next question. I know very little about grinder pumps and installations. What would a typical one-home system cost to install today? This is an important context for what you're talking about. Go for it. Yeah, there's that pregnant pause. Sorry about that. Um, it, it really depends on the region and how deep we have to install you know, I'm in the northeast where we deal with frost, so our, our stations are installed a little bit deeper than they might be down in the south in warm climate. Um, a grinder pump, depending whether it's indoors or outdoors, uh, might cost the homeowner to purchase anywhere between four and $5,000 um, to purchase the pump. And then installation can be, if it's 
decommissioning a septic tank or if it's just new development, you know, those costs vary. Uh, if it's decommissioning a septic tank and you have restoration, that will skew the cost a little bit. If it's new construction for development, then the costs are going to be lower because surface restoration is all part of the development. So seven, $8,000 for an installation over and above the cost of the pump, probably a good ballpark to start from. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let me ask you this. What type of fiscal planning is prudent for eventual pump system replacement 20 plus years out, say? Well, um, on that case, you know, if you look at the useful life of, of the pump, the pump itself, the core, has probably a 15 or 20 year life. The tank and the piping, 80 to 100 year life. Uh, the materials that are used don't degrade, or at least the materials that we use, they don't degrade as well. So uh, homeowners can uh, use a term depreciation, which we commonly don't use. People just use credit cards these days. However, setting aside a portion and expecting at year 15, we might have to replace uh, the pump. You might be looking at a cost two to three thousand dollars, including labor, to replace the core, and then you're back up in service. I think that's okay. Great. Good. Yep. Super. Okay. So uh, let's see. Next question. How do you calculate an MTBSC of 22 years on a system that's only been in service for seven? I'll take that one, Henry. Um, so the, the, the cleanest and simplest uh, equation for calculating the mean time between service calls is to take the um, product of the number of pumps times the years in service and divide that by the total number of service calls you know, during that period. That gives you the, the mean time between service calls, and that's a good predictor you know, for a mechanical device of how reliable a system is. So um, what that means, though, is like in the early years of a project, if it's, if it's designed well and installed well, um, the number of service calls should be very, very low which uh, means, you know, since you're dividing that into the number of pumps and their years in service, is going to give you a, a large number. So you could have 22 years as your mean time between service calls, even though you've only had the system in service for about seven years. And so that's the reason you get that larger number. And you can see that play out in every one of those projects if you were to look at it. Excellent. Great. Thank you. All right, what scheduled inspection work is involved? I, I'll answer that one, I guess, Chuck, is that these units are typically designed to be an appliance that should not really require a lot of preventive maintenance. Unless you get into a commercial application or, or high use, then you might uh, do some annual inspections, for, for example. In the case of Chelmsford, they did a one-time inspection because they were taking over ownership of something they, they really didn't know the status. In CMOM practices, sewer lines are inspected. Uh, many municipalities do like an average three every three years. They go in and they televise uh, gravity sewer and so forth. So a utility, if they're involved, they might want to schedule, perhaps do 30%, go through and, and test and make sure things are working. Um, you know, and that's a flexible, kind of a, a range of, of time that they might look at. And if they have a good mean time between service call report data, then they might be able to extend that out to you know every five years or something like that. Okay? Yeah, let me, uh, let me add one thing to that, Angela. Um, you noticed in one of Henry's slides that the, um, that the percentage of service calls that actually were service calls as opposed to um, abuse or other things was quite lower, uh, quite a bit lower, about half of what the total percentage of was for that one year that he noted. And so, um, like he said, if the mean time between service calls is you know, 10 or 12 or 14 years, I see utilities typically just being hands off and waiting for that service call or alarm condition to come in and then they address it. Um, if the mean time between service calls is, is lower than 10 years, there's usually good reasons for that. Uh, 
uh, it's abuse issues, it's site-related issues from poor construction practices and so forth that continue to call people from the utility or the service provider out on a regular basis. And in that case, I see utilities or owners uh, being more proactive in having somebody come out or doing greater efforts towards the education so that um, those types of call-outs and the costs of doing those call-outs are minimized. Great. Excellent. Thank you both. We have another viewer asking how to get proficiency in the design of low-pressure sewers. You want to do that one, Chuck? Sure. I, I, I can. Uh, there's a couple, couple of things that would help a designer um, understand how to design pressure sewer systems. On our website, on E1's website, we do have uh, a design manual. We also have uh, the ability to download our design assistance software, and that will allow you to um, go through and understand how we break up systems into zones, how we populate the data or the fields in the design assistant, and then you can go through and, and look at the hydraulic analysis of a system. It's very straightforward, and, and most engineers looking at it can understand that quite easily. Um, a second resource to, to help a designer, especially the first time, would be to work through one of our distributors. In this case, FR Mahoney is our distributor, and um, they, they have many, many years of experience and can easily help a designer understand some of the intricacies and, and uh, trip points, if you will, uh, for designing a pressure sewer system the first time. Because if it's, it's important that you understand how to do it uh, the first time so you avoid some of the mistakes that have been made by others in the past. Excellent. Great advice. Thank you so much. All right. Next question. How do you determine the total life cost of the gravity-based systems? That has to be verifiable, too. Well, I think that one that was covered in a webinar not too long ago that uh, Keith McHale uh, provided uh, kind of a cost evaluation for gravity sewers. Gravity sewer costs are often taken out of different budgets. They might be a public works budget, might not be in a sewer department budget. So capturing those costs can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, flushing of lines and, and, and doing the kinds of TV work and, and so forth. A good enterprise fund, which I operated for a number of years before doing this, is responsible for looking at those costs. And with CMOM practices, if they go through and they actually do the evaluation and keep track of their costs, they can get a good handle. Uh, you know, I'm seeing some oversized force mains, 12 years of, of age, that are rotting out because of sulfide because they were put in, they were too big. So some of those things are skewing costs, but a gravity sewer system, you want to look at at least a 30-year life, 40-year life when you're projecting the cost, and you have to do some digging to pull in all of the expenses that a department has. And I'm, I'm sure Chuck has more. Yeah, I, you know, in, a, in addition to what, what Henry shared, um, b both he and I have, have uh, managed and operated sewer collection systems before. Um, Depending on the utility um, and their um, their attitude towards preventive or reactive types of maintenance activities, um, you can have uh, certain aspects of maintaining a gravity sewer system deferred, you know, for for a lengthy period of time. And so, when you go through and take a look at your system, and you're starting to accumulate the cost of maintaining that system, you got to make sure that you know, uh, you don't come up and say, well, a gravity sewer system costs X amount per year to, to maintain when, when you're not taking care of root issues or you're not including um, um, flushing the lines or TV in the lines and doing those types of activities that are really designed to extend the life of that asset as long as possible. It's, it's this activity of, of looking at all the costs of maintaining a system, whichever type of technology it is, and trying to determine how you can minimize the cost over the long term to your ratepayers, and that's really what's kind of behind that CMOM activity. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned that acronym, that uh, abbreviation, rather, uh, CMOM. We had a viewer asking if you could just um, tell us what that means again, what that stands for. Yeah, CMOM, CMOM stands for Capacity Management Operations and Maintenance. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so let's see, another question from a viewer. Uh, do you have any thoughts on having spare parts and spare grinder pumps on hand to replace when systems fail? That, that's always a good practice to have. If a utility is involved, and they might be involved only tangentially, where they might be responding to the homeowner um, in, in a case where I operate a system, we actually had spare cores, and we would loan them to a resident on an emergency basis and then have the pump service by out the outside provider. So having spares certainly is a, is a good idea. In our case, a spare core drops into place and it pretty much solves the immediate need so that the pump can be evaluated, can be repaired and put back into place. In our practice, we use loaners, they're on our trucks, so we can show up to a service call and we can drop one in and do a repair in the shop if we need to. But uh, certainly spares and having parts available is a good idea. Yes, I, okay, awesome. you know, it's, a, it's, it's the same as having any municipal lift station. Uh, you're going to have a certain spare parts on hand so that uh, if you need to make repairs, you can do so in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next question. Do pressure sewer systems have any problems pumping downhill? Oh boy, here we go. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> Chuck and I have been working on this for a couple of projects recently. And downhill pumping is a novelty. And you have to manage the air in the system and you have to manage siphoning in the system. With a semi-positive displacement pump, it's much more robust and easier to operate in these conditions. And I'll when I finish, I'm going to let the professional engineer have some time as well. But um, the key is really is managing the air so that you do not siphon the, the basin, don't run the pumps dry. Built into our cores, we have anti-siphon valves so that uh, we often have a, a situation where we might have a pressure sewer and a home is up on a hill and they have to pump down into the sewer to then pump back up over the next hill. And so built in on the services, we have... Uh, the anti-siphon assembly to protect the system. And then when you get into a larger system, we might use a combination air and vacuum relief valves to manage the air, and then the system can work in a series of fill and drain situations. And um, I'll give Chuck some time here. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, air management is definitely one of the issues to be considered. But I, I often have people look at me and say, why would I need to pump downhill? And, um, you know, if you have a, say, it's a waterfront area and a little hillside next to it, and the street, you know, you're going to have houses along the waterfront, and then you're going to have a street usually above that, and then above that you're going to have more houses that cost less, right, that are above the street. And so in the street you've got a pressurized force main. It's not a gravity line typically. And so in order to get into that main, every house along that main, has to has to pump into it essentially. So those homes that are above the line, above the hydraulic grade line of that 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 force main, are going to have to pump into that to that line, and which requires them to go downhill. So that's usually where you see this application in play. Um, and finally, the 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 answer is yes and no because if you have a progressing cavity pump, you can pump downhill. But if you have a centrifugal style pump, you're not going to be able to pump downhill. And that's because a centrifugal pump relies on back pressure so it'll perform on its curve. Uh, you take away that back pressure and it just will run off the end of its curve. But a progressing cavity pump is entirely different nature. And so as long as it's turning, it's putting some volume out, regardless of whether it's going downhill in a negative head pressure situation or uphill. 
Excellent. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. You know, with that, we are getting very close to the top of our hour together. And of course, we want to be respectful of people's time. Um, We are grateful that they chose to spend this hour with us. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. But I do want to let our audience know that uh, any unanswered questions, and we had a lot of great questions come in, uh, any unanswered questions will be forwarded over to our presenters today uh, for answering offline. So uh, don't be discouraged that your question didn't get selected uh, out loud today. You will still get an answer. So we appreciate uh, all of you with the great questions that you submitted today. So with that, on behalf of Penwell Corporation, I just want to thank today's speakers, Chuck Mayhew and Henry Albro, and our sponsor, E1 Sewer Systems, for the presentation you saw today, which was called The True Cost of Pressure Sewer Ownership. And remember, a certificate of attendance will be available for today's presentation, it will be issued automatically via email to all attendees at the conclusion of the webcast. Just please make sure you stay logged in until you see the congratulations message. That's how our system will recognize that you want that certificate. One final note, the presentation you saw today will be archived within 24 hours and it can be accessed from the homepage at waterworld.com. We will send out a reminder email message to all registrants. It will have a direct link to that archive. And finally, we want to thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to serving you with future webcasts. This concludes today's presentation.